views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Over the years, we have checked into Bronx Community Board to see from a grassroots level how things are going in Bronx neighborhoods. Community boards, in many cases, are the vehicle through which Bronxites can have input into how things go in a wide range of important aspects of Bronx life, like housing, schools, development, jobs, and their interaction with the city of New York. Tonight we have two community board district managers with us, both have experience in Bronx political offices as well as in the mechanics of how things work or not work in their community boards. So let's find out what's happening in Community Board 7, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Bedford Park, Fordham, Jerome Park, Kingsbridge Heights, Norwood, and University Heights. Nice to see District Manager Aisha Bravo. Nice to have you back. Thank you for having me. And let's find out about what's happening in Community Board 6, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Bathgate, Belmont, East Tremont, and West Farms. District Manager John Sanchez, nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you for having me. Um, John, let's start with you. Uh, you have told me more than once about this funding that community boards received, and you were excited about it and what you were going to be doing with it. Um, $42,000. Yes. Sounds like a lot for some, yes. not a lot for others, because there's always more. Um, th has the $42,000 of extra funding been significant? Have you been able to do anything with it? Let's talk about that. Oh, it's been a great help for us. Um, community boards have limited budgets, and this one-year bonus of money, we're able to do, we were able to do Saturday volleyball programming for youth, so more than 100 youth have been playing volleyball for more than three months in Community Board 6. We've also been doing financial literacy workshops for the past five weeks to make sure people know about managing their finances, investing, et cetera. And it allows the community board to expand our reach and also to do more direct services to the neighborhood. You know, I want to just get our arms around the $42,000. Yes. And I expressed it that way deliberately because when you hear about funding for programs and yes. other things, you generally hear and they say, well, they got a million dollars. And then there are organizations that say, well, you know, that's, that's good. That's nice that we have it. But it's not really enough to do this, that, or yes. the other. $42,000. And yet you're talking about actually starting programs. Talk to me about stretching that money or yes. using that money. I mean, you want to talk about specifically what the volleyball program costs? Just give yes. us a sense of how $42,000 can actually have impact in, you know, I don't want to say changing a community, but improving a community. Well, as district managers, we have to be able to stretch out our budgets a long way. And a lot of programs aren't really expensive. So for example, the volleyball programming that we did for 12 weeks of Saturday programming, that was only about $5,000 to use the Boys and Girls Club's great gym. For the financial literacy workshops, five weeks of workshops, four hours each day, that was only $3,000. So there are a lot of nonprofits that are able to do work at a lower cost. Uh, other uh, objectives with that money yet? Or are you yes. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, like all of us who are saving, <laughs> and you, you put it in your pocket and you say oh, a little bit at a time? We're planning to do a 5K run slash walk um, to bring awareness about lupus. And we're also planning to do more events in Tremont Park. So a lot of community outreach, especially in the spring and summer months. It's fascinating. And, and when you think about um, the amount of money that community boards or others um, reach out and try to get funding, the amount you could do with it, of course, if you're careful about it. Yes, it's a 25% increase in our budget, and we're hoping it gets baselined in the next budget because there's 59 community boards across the city. This extra money goes a long way. 
Uh, and this came through city council funding? The city council is very generous. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm going to be the guy to say they gave you some funding. I don't know how very generous it is, but it was a good start. Uh, what about for you? Has it had an impact? Uh, you've been able to do something with it in uh, Community Board 7? Right. We just recently put together a proposal to hire two consultants, one to develop um, an an outline of the economic development trends in our district, mm -hmm. as well as the housing, the impact of housing development. What would um, the objective of doing that kind of analysis be? Like, what what are you hoping to learn and then ultimately implement uh, for the uh, community board? So, one of the biggest things we've seen, I've been district manager here for a year, is the um, overdevelopment. We're getting a lot of development, which is we need. We need permanent housing but we're not considering the infrastructure. So I think an analysis of what's going on and what impact it has in our schools and our mass transit and hospitals will further confirm our point in hoping that our cries um, reach City Hall. Development is the magic word all across the borough of the Bronx. Um, we, we have it, it's here, it's happening. Yes. Um, some like it, some don't like it. Sometimes it works out extremely well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, talk to me about uh, specifically when you say overdevelopment, what does that mean? Every neighborhood uh, needs housing. Where, you know, the, the, the crunch is, is out there. Um, what, what's overdevelopment for you, and, and what are the problems? I think I'm going to be specific to subsidized housing. Um, I think it's a necessity. We all need affordable housing. Uh, but when you're not taking into consideration the saturation in our schools, because ideally when you build affordable housing or any type of development, you're getting families. And I think that it's important that we start talking about our schools. Our District 10 is the third most saturated in the city of New York, and that's a big problem. And we've seen what's recently happened in Montefiore, where it's over capacity, right? And then we have issues in our mass transit. There's no parking. There's so many issues, and I feel like these things need to be taken into consideration before we, style, we start giving out these subsidies. So there is, um, uh, you know, you look at any number of different projects, and right now, if you, especially if you're building um, so-called affordable housing, you got to have supportive uh, facilities and supportive programs, and you, you just have to. Uh, what you're saying is, great, we've got a plot of land, whether it was done through as of right or whether okay. you know, it was something that went through the community board, and they build this bu these buildings, but there's no taking into account for schools and mass transit, et cetera. If you were to hold up the building of new housing until they create more seats in schools, maybe we'll never get the housing. And that, that's a, a suggestion that I'm making because it's going to take the DOE forever to get. You know, I'm just playing out what you're saying. Like, how, how can we make those things work together? In other words, if we get the funding for buildings uh, and for supportive housing, and then we hold it because we didn't get an increase well, in mass transit, uh, you know what I mean? Trying to co I, I agree that we need to make that plan. I'm just wondering if one is going to hold up the other. Well, I think the goal is not holding it. It's kind of just at least analyzing, having the conversation. And I think no one is having that conversation. And we need to start to. I mean, we have vacant spaces now in, within Community Board 7 that we could start looking at potentially building a school. And we're not. We're just allowing... Um, you know, these groups to come in and continue to build housing. And no one's trying to stop them. We encourage them. I actually think that the nonprofits coming into our district are, will be doing a good job. Our issue overall is that we need to start having these conversations, and unfortunately we do not have direct communication with the Department of Education and community boards. And that's a problem. As you said earlier, we are grassroots, right? We are the boots on the ground. And what better um, pipeline than us? Yeah, well, you're going you're to have to deal with all the problems <laughs> and all the complaints if it doesn't go well. There's one project, and we didn't talk about it beforehand, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I happen to love this Bedford greenhouse. That's got, are you familiar with it? It's, going, it's in Bedford Park. It's being built about, around a big rock. And they're putting a, a, a greenhouse on top and a hydroponics farm and all that. So you're unfamiliar with it. I'm sorry that I'm yeah, not yeah. asking you about it ahead of time. But to me, that's the kind of housing we need. It was on a plot of land that was undeveloped, and now they're putting up whatever, six or eight or ten stories, whatever it's going to be. But your point, I think, is well taken. That If you do that, you really got to have, uh, I mean, people move in. Where, they, where the kids well, go to One schools. of the things that I've stressed is um, environmental studies are usually done with, on city property. They're not done on as-of-right properties, but they're still city subsidized. And I think that there should be some side of um, environmental study attached to city money. It's still city money, whether the land is private or not. We, we, you know, I've said this a million times in this show. We never plan. 
We never make a big plan. We'll you know, say, hey, we've got housing, we'll put it up. Which brings us now to Community Board 6. Story came out recently that the Hebrew home in Riverdale was going to be building senior housing on Arthur Avenue. Yes. Um, this may, although presumably some of those seniors don't need uh, school seats, but this may fit right into what uh, Ms. Bravo is saying, that, that here you're, you're getting a new senior housing project. Um, uh, do you have the infrastructure? Is that ever a dialogue? Does that come up? I, are you ever able to say, here's the answer to that? It's one thing if it comes up, it's another thing to have an answer for it. Senior housing is uh, one of the things that the board has, has often requested. Um, because a lot of affordable housing is for families. It could be a set aside for formerly homeless, but seniors, there's seniors that are, you know, living at home or they, they, their family leaves. So then they have an apartment that's too big, but they want to downsize. And getting something affordable when they're on a fixed income, they don't, they don't have a salary, they're retired. Um, affordable senior housing is a priority. So Hebrew Home obviously um, understands how to do that. Yes. The, the biggest problem, as I can see, and maybe both of you can break down a little bit about how this process works, is that, you know, what's the incentive for developers to, if they don't get subsidies, what is the incentive to them to build housing for people on fixed incomes or people on low incomes? It becomes a very difficult um, uh, prospect to try and do that. Um, how, how, do we, how do we incentivize that? Are we incentivizing it properly or is simply mixed income and maybe 20% for affordable the way to go? So for seniors, I think it goes... <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 it, goes, it, goes, it goes to their mission. And I can see she's <laughs> say, thinking the same thing. For Hebrew Home, their mission, they're a nonprofit developer, so their mission is not purely for profit. So they're okay with, you know, working with people that are getting fixed income, seniors, et cetera. So your larger question of are subsidies required? Um, I think it depends on the location. I think certain locations in the city wouldn't require a subsidy. They'll get it rented right away. Certain areas in the city, there's still been a reluctance to invest. So the subsidies have to be there. Mm -hmm. you, you have um, some interesting developments coming up um, that I, I, or around the corner from Webster Avenue, I guess, yes. on, on Tremont. Oh, yeah. And those um, uh, projects, as I understand, really are going to be affordable. Uh, there are stores in the, in, the, um, in the first floor. Just give me a status update of where those are at. So that's the Tremont Renaissance Project. That's the one. It's a more than 200 unit uh, development and it, there's going to be, uh, the plan is for there to be a supermarket, a gym, and apartments will be renting from like $900 all the way to about $2,000. So it'll really be a mixed um, income development. Which is exactly what you want because yes. there's a little bit of money then to pay for um, uh, you know, the building of it and, and keep the developers exactly. as happy as possible and, of course, uh, still, um, you know, maintain what we need. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, I saw you no. had made a face when I asked the question. No, I, to John's point, I, I think what he's saying is similar to what Community Board 7 has been saying for a while. If you look at our, our statement of needs um, that we do with the City of New York, that's something that we've stressed, which is mixed income, which is to be inclusive of all the needs of the district. Uh, let's talk about schools. I know, and, and you've already brought up the whole idea of overcrowding. Um, uh, how, do, how do we communicate to the DOE that, okay, this is really like a problem and it has to be dealt with so that somebody really takes a look at that? Do you have an answer to that question? Well, for starters, I, I, I would hope that they would um, come to our meetings. And, and here are some of our, our concerns. I think most of the community boards in the Bronx have an education or youth committee, and that would be the way to start, um, if they can start kind of participating with us. So you think they don't, they don't really hear what you're saying? They or do what, not, what unfortunately. The people in the community boards? They do not. Um, we, we've made several attempts to reach out. We write letters. Um, we inquire when new programs are being presented, and unfortunately, we do not have that communication. This raises a really a larger question about the role of community boards. We know that uh, during the Giuliani administration, it was downsized, uh, the budgets were, were cut and all that. Um, my sense is, aside from elected officials who do, in many cases, listen to community boards, is that the city of New York is like, yeah, we know that you guys had something to say, and we put it aside. The borough president has a, you know, the, the cabinet meetings and all that kind of stuff, but they don't really listen. Is is there a proper? And I'm not talking about, gee, what street is going to be cleaned and some of the mechanics, but when it comes to planning and things, is there communication? Is there? Um, 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 interaction with the city of New York or does it go through your elected officials? 
I would say for the most part, every agency is pretty interactive with us. I don't know if you disagree with that, but they pretty pretty much come to us and include us in most of the conversations when it comes to changes or additions in our districts. Unfortunately, DOE is not one of them. <laughs> oh, excuse me for laughing. I was just I was. And an I think it's important. Laugh. We're looking at our kids. We're looking at our future. And as a parent, I think it's vital that we have. Have you had a sense that the new chancellor um, uh, maybe uh, has a better point of view on that, or not yet? I have to give him some time for that. No, I can read it all over. I have to give him some time. He is fairly new. They they came up with the Bronx plan, uh, which um, apparently thirty two schools in the Bronx will be uh, receiving funding and a greater um, um, maneuverability for teachers to control curriculums and make decisions in, in schools. Uh, none of your you we talked about it before. None of your schools are. None of them are in board seven. Uh, do you know if they're in board seven? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. What what are, what are schools? Uh, what are they saying? What are parents saying? Um, same thing. Overcrowding. Uh, talk to me. Overcrowding is a large issue, and I think goes back to Aisha's point. So here's the issue with community boards, construction, and building schools. A lot of seats the school construction authority, which actually builds the schools, a lot of the seats are already funded. Their issue that they raise is that they can't find the location. But I know, for example, I specifically sent them all the vacant lots in Community Board 6 to say, here are viable options to build a school. And I never received a response. And that's the recurring thing that we see with the DOE. Uh, I've done the it, same. You get the same thing. Um, is the issue, well, building a school from scratch is such a major undertaking? You're talking, I mean, uh, round numbers, $45 million. I mean, it could be even more depending on what you know, they want to build. And that becomes a really big issue, obviously, for the city. Somebody's got to allocate that funding as opposed to saying, well, we have an old church or something else that might be used for schools. In other words, it's nice to say build on this plot. It's another thing to say let's get the funding and the wherewithal to do that. Well, the School Construction Authority has the funding to build a school from scratch. They're just choosing not to build on the sites that we send them. Uh, I guess it was an ironic question because St. Joseph uh, was just yes. announced to be closing in yes. uh, your community. Um, what do you think will happen with that property? It's now, Tolentine, also, um, the Tolentine, is that in your district? Yeah. It is in your mm -hmm. district. Okay. Yes, it's that's a the other one that's closing. Yeah, it's a shame. St. Joseph School has been in the community since 1877, uh, Catholic school, K-3 school, and it's closing because of low enrollment. Uh, my expectation is that I don't think the DOE will take it over. I think another school operator will take it over. Um, another meaning a charter school? Probably a charter school, yes. I see. And are, you, are you now dropping a hint of something you know that nobody else No, has no, about? no hint. <laughs> well, you know, uh, over, um, I guess it's Community Board 8, um, that visitation had closed, and yes. there are those who yeah, wanted to be it. allocated uh, to be a public school. Elected officials have talked about that, but they haven't been able to, because it has to go through the archdiocese, which goes all the way back to the Vatican, yes. literally, and they haven't been able to, um, to do that. Um, so at the moment, we haven't heard, but you don't know that it's going to be a uh, public school yet. We do not know. It's so early. Um, they're also demolishing the church across the street, and that's slated to be affordable housing. So there's a lot of dynamics. There's going to be affordable housing and a school being closed down. So who I, knows? Well, listen, this dialogue just went around in circles because yeah. now you're saying, well, we're building affordable housing, but you folks uh, acknowledge that if we do that, we've got to deal with schools. What about um, other infrastructure like shopping or um, transportation? Are these issues in your area? Now, CB7 is not quite like a transportation desert like some of the East Bronx no. locations. Um, are those other issues or are schools the really big uh, issue for you? Uh, school is like the bigger issue. Mass transit is always a, a topic, right? Uh, we definitely need, um, the elevator has been something that we've been are fighting for, the Mashulu train station. Mm -hmm. That's something that we've asked for because of Montefiore's proximity to that train station. That would be the train stop. And we're not taking into consideration those patients. So I think it's very important that we have those conversations. And we were told by the MTA that, unfortunately, for this fiscal year, well, the upcoming fiscal year, it's not a conversation in our district. No, oh, it's not. Yeah, no, so right I'll now. take it, it off it, the it'll, table it'll, here on Bronx Net Yeah, television. it'll be um, up for consideration in the next fiscal year. I was um, told. Let's talk about the health of the small business community. Um, the, the city just put a moratorium on this whole fines for signs uh, concept. Um, how are, uh, talk to me about uh, shopping districts. Let's see, you've got Kingsbridge, uh, you've got the, uh, the Bainbridge shopping district. How, how healthy are they? Uh, empty uh, storefronts, tell me what you got. So we have two bids and two merchant association. We have the Jerome bid, 
which is associated with Montefiore. We have the Ford and Bid. We have the 204th Street and Bainbridge Merchant Association and uh, Kingsbridge Merchant Association. Right. And I guess I'll start with Kingsbridge, which is my home. And it's pretty empty, and it's been empty for quite some time. And if you ask some empty of Empty storefronts. Yes. Um, and you, if you ask them, they're all waiting to see what's going to happen with the armory. They feel that it's going to have an adverse effect on what they decide to do with their businesses. You know, I, I wonder if that's an adverse effect or they're waiting because they're hoping to get a really big effect that if the armory opens and it's used for an ice center and all that right. kind of stuff, nobody wants to build yet because they make a commitment and then those dynamics could change. That it could, could be. be, and then you also have a lot of businesses who do not have a permanent lease. They're renting month to month, They, which is they would issue. be very concerned, yes. I would think. And we have a lot. We have about six or seven of them that are month what, to month. What are, now, the armory, I realize, is something, I mean, that's a whole other dialogue. Um, but what are the answers in, in general? Like, the, the Jerome Gunhill bid is very healthy, isn't it, in terms of stores and storefronts? I mean, you drive up Jerome Avenue, walk up Jerome Avenue, it's pretty healthy, right? Yeah, I think the issues the bids are having right now are with the homeless encampments. Mm-hmm. That's that's one of their bigger issues. And, and where where like be specific where? Oh, the Jerome bid on the Jerome Avenue strip, and then on Fordham, you see them constantly, you know, in the, congregating in the those park areas. areas near the train station. Those no, kind? literally in front of stores. Wow. Yeah, we see that. I mean, this is something that Board Six and I have been working on because we have this issue at Fordham Plaza as well. Uh, you want to let's start there, and then we're going to go back and talk about the um, uh, you know the business communities. The issue with Fordham Plaza is that DOT owns the land and they didn't have a backup plan when the Fordham bid decided not to take it over. So right now they have to release an RFP for someone to take over the individual sites. There's they a have site, not done yet. They have a site that could fit a 50 seat restaurant, but they need to release the RFP for that to start making traction. Mm. How, how are the business strips, let's say, on um, uh, Tremont Avenue? you got East Tremont and then, of course, West Tremont. So something exciting about East Tremont. Um, Roll so the drums, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the community board worked with the Department of Small Business Services, and we were awarded 207000 for a storefront improvement program. And SBS is going to start going door-to-door -to, -door to the businesses to let them know that this is available for them to apply to. The application is due in about four weeks. And, and what, where, where is that going to... Um, uh, the, catch, the catchment area is East Tremont between Prospect and Southern Boulevard. Okay, I know exactly where that is. Um, how healthy are those businesses? Or they will be healthier <laughs> after they get a little upgrade? So East Tremont does have some empty storefronts, but uh -huh. there are exciting things coming to East Tremont. A Blink Fitness just opened up on East Tremont. Um, Popular Bank relocated and expanded their branch on East right. Tremont. We have a few new restaurants, so things are coming. Uh, what contributes to the ability of those stores to be able to do that? Is it the new developments that are coming? Uh, you know, the, the one, for example, on, uh, on yes. uh, Webster Avenue? I think there's there's a lot of housing coming up on Tremont and Webster, but also West Farms and West Farms and East That's Tremont right. Avenue. So right. when you have an influx of more than 2,000 units of housing, those are people that are going to go out and shop. Uh, you were telling me about uh, this workforce, the West Farms Workforce One program. Yes. So I want to ask you about that. I have some interesting questions about Workforce One in general, but let's yes, so, start there. So with the West Farms Workforce One also opened up on East Tremont about a year and a half ago, and they cater towards 18 to 24-year-olds, helping them with their resume, cover letter, but also jobs in web development, construction pre-skills to get an apprenticeship, and um, also web development. Some of the dialogues, and this goes back a couple of years, that I've had with Workforce One is that I, I had the sense that they were jobs that were nice kind of fill-in-the-middle jobs, but not ways of launching people to change their lives and improve their careers. But if you say they're doing web development and other things, maybe that's changed. Yes. I, don't, I don't want to make a negative judgment, but I always wondered if it really was all it was cracked up to be if you're just getting people you know, um, um, jobs in stores, you know, that kind of thing. I think when people think of a workforce development center, they think of they're going to go into this big city agency and it'll be an unwelcoming environment. But the West Farms Workforce One Center is very inviting. This classroom space, it's a brand new building, and you can pursue your education, but also learn about web development. They have a culinary skills program. See, that, uh, those so kinds careers. of things I like that really can launch people. I want to ask you both before we run out of time, uh, and now you've got the big Bronx River Arts Center, oh, yes. which has opened up. It is just such a spectacular oh, yes. building. What I love about it is that it's, a, it's like a stake in the ground that um, you know, the borough of the Bronx supports the arts. It, you can't miss it. It's gorgeous. 
it's helped the community, right? 100%. They have arts classes for young people, adults, everyone. And what's exciting, next Thursday, we're going to have a free performance of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, in, in that space? In the Bronx space. River Arts Center. It's just a spectacular thing. And for you, uh, Ms. Bravo, I, I got to tell you, I love that the, it, it's a little thing, but that totem pole right at the beginning of, of the Grand Concourse, and because it changes, right? They do news. That, so let's describe yeah. that, that. That came out of the Jerome Gunhill bid, right? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Let's talk about that. And for anybody and everybody who goes on the, the north end of the Grand Concourse, take a look at this totem pole, which is created by the community. It's fantastic. Go ahead. No, I think it's amazing. It's very attractive, and that's one of the things that we want to bring to the community board, and to, especially to the Grand Concourse. And, they, and, they and change that's it. where all the development is happening. So. Um, <laughs> talk to me about um, uh, youth activities. Of course, you have the Marshall the Montefiore Community Center. I guess that would be a way to say you have that, and they have uh, the Bronx River Arts Center, um, one of the most dynamic uh, institutions, of course, uh, in, in, in the borough. How are kids doing? How are families doing with activities? and? Uh, things for them. I think MMCC is definitely an asset to Community Board 7. Um, most of the programs in the schools are administered through MCC. So they have the, so they have after done school programs. The after school programs. Day camp yes. and all that kind and of And it's also adult programming. It's not just the youth. Yeah, they also work with the adults. Uh, in terms of um, youth crime, youth activities, uh, I'm, I'm always concerned about that. I always feel like we've got to give our kids more. How, how are you doing that? It becomes a, so uh, look, everybody's got the issue. We know that. Right. But just want to measure where we're at. So we are fortunate now. We just got Bragg. Bragg was um, working out of the Bragg? Corsix. Bragg, yeah, they really? deal with the How youth. do I not know what that is? It's, uh, help me out here, because it's in the Corsix. Um, I think they're a group that right. uh, tries to acronym. stem gun violence. Oh. Right? No, no, I know oh. the another group, but I meant like the acronym. I did not oh, know that. Right. <laughs> so we'll they deal all, with the we'll Google it. We'll look it up. So, so the, the the group of folks that quick, go out, go they do they do outreach in the community to help the youth. And typically, the people who are the counselors are people who were formerly offenders themselves and that have you know fixed uh, their life. Effective. Very effective. I'm happy to have it in the 5-2. They're launching this month. Do you think if you did more of the volleyball programs, if you had, if we doubled your 42,000, which I know you would love, yes. you would run more programs like that? We would have open gyms and five gyms in the summer. All right. <laughs> Trying to give answers. To me, that's my answer. John you Sanchez. You have to keep the kids busy. How to keep them busy. John Sanchez from Community Board 6, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, Aisha Bravo from Community Board 7, thank you so much. And uh, folks, just look up the community boards, call, interact, you know, have your say. That's the thing. Uh, and then if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything, of course, going up uh, in the fall of the Bronx, then email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can send a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. And uh, we thank our producer, who's Helen Greenberg, the directors, William Guzman and Nick Marrero. We have a whole new crew of interns working on the show. How wonderful. And we'll see you next week. Oh, next week, the uh, debate for public advocate right on our show. <laughs>